said, I can't stop. And I had to press on. And while I'm pressing on, they're updating. There's another gunshot victim down in the classroom on the north side of the school. I end up linking up with a couple deputies. We start clearing classrooms to get to that class and get fire in there. And, and they start treating her. And then there's another gunshot victim got it into the administrative office. Other deputies got to, to them with fire. And then they said there's another gunshot victim in the choir room. We didn't know where the choir room was. So it was like a little chaotic trying to figure out how the hell do we get to the choir room. Took a team and we started clearing to finding kids and hiding in closets and all kinds of stuff trying to get to that kid. She served, that girl survived. She got shot in the stomach too. Um, the thing about active shooter training, most people that watch this that have ever been through it, you're no good to anybody if you get emotionally involved and stop at a victim. I don't care what the victim looks like. If, if there's an active shooter and they're still putting victims down, it does you no good to stop and help. As sad as that is to sound, that it does sound, we have to bypass victims to get to the shooter to put them down. We have to stop them from creating more victims. We have to. And that's what I had to do that morning. And it, I'll forever remember that morning. I'll forever remember Gracie's face. I'll forever wonder. Okay, can you introduce yourself for me, please? My name is Robert Gillis. Um, I'm 53 years old. I'm currently retired. I served 25 years with the LA County Sheriff's Department, and now I live in Idaho. I'm a political <laughs> refugee from Idaho, or from <laughs> California to Idaho. And Robert, uh, when did you start? I started April 1996, and I retired in March of 21. Okay. Was there anything, tell me a little bit about growing up, and was there anything growing up in your background that led you to law enforcement? Well, when I was a kid, um, my mom was dating a cop. I was nine years old. Uh, he was shot and killed on Christmas Eve. Um, that kind of was a shock. I mean, obviously being nine years old, waking up on Christmas Eve morning, my mom's crying and, and upset. And I knew I knew him and been to the station and been in his patrol car. And, and so it was hard for me. But I never had thought I wanted to be a cop. I was the little kid that wanted to be a fireman. And then that happened and, and I started seeing that camaraderie, I think, even at a young age, and I started thinking it was cool to be a cop. And when I turned 14 and a half, I became a police explorer at a police department. And what is that for people that don't know? It's a cadet program for young kids, 14 to 21, that are geared, their minds are geared towards wanting to be in law enforcement. Or you have kids maybe that are even getting into some trouble. You're trying to steer them clear of that trouble, give them something to look forward to, get them to learn how uh, police departments operate that the cops aren't evil, that they could be your friends. Um, and you put time in, like directing traffic, help them doing fingerprints at the station, um, and you go on ride-alongs. And that was the most fun part. So I did that from 14 years old. Um, I left that department and went to the LA County Sheriff's Department Explorer Program at Malibu Station, which was a lot of fun. Um, beach team, I got to ride on the beach team all the time. I made a bunch of friends there that were cops. As I got older, I was 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, and I put in like three days a week at the station, um, working the desk, answering 911 calls. I was pretty trusted back then because I, I, everybody knew me and I put in the time. Um, how old were you at the time? 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. And then I started testing to be a cop at 20 and a half. Um, so I, I did that for a while. Um, and then when I turned 20 and a half, I started testing. We went on a hiring freeze and I got stuck. So I went and got my EMT, went to work for an ambulance company and continued testing other agencies. LAPD was doing a big hiring push, but they wanted minorities. Um, so I, it was a kind of a, I knew I was spinning my, my wheels doing it, but I just at least wanted to stay fresh on the physical fitness and that type of stuff. Um, and then I tested for Montebello PD and Glendale PD. They were hiring like one or two items with 500 applicants. It was very tough competition. So I ended up not getting hired by those agencies. Um, April of 96, I started the LA County Sheriff's Academy. And in June of 96, LAPD contacted me and said, hey, we want to hire you. And I was like, I turned LAPD on. I'm two, two months into the Sheriff's Academy. I'm not leaving that. Right. And I didn't want to work for LAPD. I wanted to work for the Sheriff's Department. So what? Why? All of my friends went to the Sheriff's Department. It's all I knew really at the time from being an explorer at Malibu. Uh, the other thing that was cool about Malibu, it probably sounds ridiculous, but you got to meet movie stars all the time and, and 
you know, music icons and, and sports icons and, you know, Tommy Lasorda and some of these different people. It was, it was fun. Dick Clark, I met, you know, all these different people. So that was fun. So I just had a really positive experience as a kid growing up. I stayed out of trouble. Um, and I decided that LA County Sheriff's was my, my thing. I had a lot of respect on it. Not that LAPD didn't. It was just a different environment. All my buddies were getting hired and going to custody. And I wanted to go back to work with my friends from high school even uh, that, that got hired. Any brothers or sisters? I don't have any brothers or sisters. Okay. No. okay. All right. So when do you officially get... What What age are you when you officially start with LA Sheriff? 25. 25. Okay. And I talked to other sheriff's deputies... So explain this to me. Typically, as opposed to a police department or a federal agency, the sheriffs always start as a, what you're, I guess the term would be a custody, custodial deputy, custody deputy. Custody deputy. So, and that's in the jail. Why, why is that? Why start in the jail? It is a system that's set up that way. Occasionally you'll have a different scenario where somebody will go straight to the street, but it's unique. Um, oftentimes it may be somebody who speaks Russian, um, and they'll send them straight to patrol at West Hollywood station because there was a big Armenian Russian population in that area. So it depended. There were certain people that, that would go straight to custody. Some would go straight to the courts back then, uh, cause we ran all the court system for LA County also. Um, but primarily, you know, you go to custody and the whole idea of it we have to staff it number one. So it's, it's easy manpower to pull out of the academy and fill these jails with personnel, which has to happen. Um, but it teaches you a lot. You get to learn how to, to work with people, deal with people, the worst of society. Um, you see a lot of bad stuff in there. You talk to a lot of bad people, but you learn a lot. You learn how to talk to these people. Um, you get into fights, you learn how to use force. You learn how, if you get hit to hit back and it just teaches you a lot of good things to when you get to the street and things are not as controlled as a jail. In a jail, everybody's kind of cooped up. You have all kinds of resources and backup around you. Um, you're constantly training and you're in the best physical fitness of your, your career, really. And you go to the streets, now you're by yourself. Now you may have a partner, you may not. Your next backup may be five minutes away, 10 minutes away. You get into a fight, you need to know what to do. You need to know that what it feels like to be in a fight, how to use all those tools that they taught you in the academy, all the things you learned in custody. Um, and also on the flip side of that, not necessarily for the purposes of fighting everybody, because that's not what we do. It's a very low percentage on that. You learn how to de-escalate. You learn how to just talk to people. You don't have to be intimidated when somebody's screaming at you or threatening you. You can bring it down a notch just based on the, the skills that you learn in custody. Talking to those guys every day. You learn about tattoos, uh, neighborhoods, rivalries, uh, crime trends, drugs, what drugs look like. Drugs are coming in and out of our jails too. So you learn what heroin smells like. You learn what it looks like, what it smells like, the different ways it comes in. You're going to see it on the street. You learn how you'll have a dealer that may talk to you. You have all kinds of, of convicts or, or guys that are just in custody fighting their cases will talk. It's amazing what they'll, they'll tell you. Um, They'll tell you how they package dope, how they traffic their dope, um, all kinds of stuff. So it's a wealth of knowledge in custody that is invaluable when you get to the street. And police agencies, it's awesome to go straight to the street. Um, but I think that they are behind on the level of education, street level education, not, not academy education or law, mm -hmm. but street level knowledge yeah. I think that they're behind. Okay. Okay. So you start off at 25 in the jail. How long are you, are you there? I was there for about 19 months. Okay. Um, I was working, I ended up in the gang unit in the jail uh, because I had taken such a liking to working with gangs. Part of the reason why is on August 14th of 1997, my friend Shane York, who was a fellow deputy at, at work, um, he and his fiance, who was another friend at work, Jennifer, uh, were at a hair salon in Buena Park, California. And two Crip gang members from uh, Long Beach and Compton came in to do a robbery takeover. They put him down on the floor. They searched him. They found his badge and they executed him. And uh, they threatened to kill her. They stuck a gun to her head, too, because they found her badge in her purse. The other guy talked him out of it. Uh, Kevin Boyce and Andre Willis are the, the suspects in that. Kevin Boyce is on death row. Death row is non-existent in California anymore. Um, 
And then I went through the aftermath. I responded to the hospital. I saw Jennifer covered in blood. We were there for like two days until they finally pulled the plug and he passed away. Um, and then I went through the memorials afterwards. I represented our department and went through the aftermath with, with her. Um, she's still like a she's like a sister. I, I still talk to her. She's finally remarried, has kids. She married an LA County fireman like years later. Uh, but it wasn't always that cheery. It was There was a dark period in there. But... I went off on that tangent because when that happened in custody, I made the decision, I'm gonna work gangs. And it was because those Crips killed my buddy. And so I put 110% into a gang cop life and learning everything I possibly could with gangs, street gangs, cartels, organized crime, Mexican mafia, um, and everything from that point on. That's, that's what I geared up for. So tell me a little bit about what you did working in the gang unit in jail? What what are, what were your functions in terms of a, of a gang unit within a jail? Well, there's a lot of crime that occurs in jail. There's a lot of beatdowns. Um, you got people that come in every day, what we call the chain. The chain is when new inmates are coming in off of a bus. You line up in the hallways, they strip down. You got to make sure they don't have any contraband that's visible on them, butt naked. Uh, you search their property, you look at their tattoos, photograph their tattoos talk to them, figure out what neighborhood they're from. If you don't already, can't already tell what, what the tattoos are. Um, and they get sent into their dorms. Well, when they go to their dorms, we're also intelligence. We're working intelligence stuff. So we're intercepting kites. Kites are jail notes. Um, it's biz, gang business within the custody facilities. They, they will make them as tiny as they possibly can. They secrete them in their lip. They secrete them up their, their butt. Um, Sometimes they're careless and they'll put it in the binder of a book, like tucking it down and they'll have a Bible and we'd find shanks and Bibles and all kinds of shanks are not like not jail made knives. Um, but the business was always going. It didn't matter if it was two in the morning when everybody's supposed to be asleep. If it's 10 in the morning, if it's three in the afternoon, 10 at night, business was always going amongst the, the criminal element. Um, you'd have hits that would happen. Hits would get called in. Somebody would come in on the chain get put in a dorm and they have some beef with somebody on the street because we have all kinds of people all housed together, 120 inmates in one dorm together, bad things happen. The jail I went to, East Max, the one that Shane and Jennifer and I all work, um, I think at one time we had 2,000 inmates. Each dorm had about 90 to 110, 115, 120 inmates. Um, and we'd have riots all the time, all the time. Um, we had facility riots. And where dorms are going off and we're throwing sting ball grenades and launching gas and moving on to the next dorm. And then that dorm kicks off again and we're all, and we have other, other uh, jails and even outside agencies coming to help us when they got so bad. Um, so jail life, the gang portion of it was identifying gang members, identifying current intelligence, hit lists, hit lists on the street contacting people on the streets, you see a hit on a piece of paper and you know it's an LAPD's jurisdiction, contacting LAPD, getting hold there, getting people saying, hey, we intercepted a kite in custody. They're saying they're going to hit so-and-so in whatever hood that's in your area. Can you guys, you know, give me a call back? And then they would. We start working with those agencies. Um, a lot of it was taking pictures of faces and tattoos, logging them on FI cards, um, invaluable tool later on in life with murders and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it basically was a straight intelligence gathering operation, working uh, gangs. In the, in, and it also gave me tremendous experience for the street. Because yeah. when I went out to the streets, I knew all the hoods. I knew where they were. I knew who the players were. I knew who the shot callers were. And kind of, I felt like it gave me a leg up because I took so much time focusing on it in custody. I didn't just go to work and sit there and do my eight hours and go home or my 16 hour overtime shift and go home. I would actually do the work. Okay. I'm going to ask you some real specific stuff once we start talking about the gang stuff. But give me an idea when you're working in the jail in particular, what type of gangs are you working with? Are you working predominantly Clips? Uh, I'm sorry, Crips, Bloods, is Norteños, Sereños. Who are you dealing with gang-wise inside the prison or inside the jail? Anybody Hispanic, if they weren't what we call a Paisa or like a Mexican national type, um, they were Sereños. They were Southsiders. They were <clears throat> associated with the Mexican Mafia. We didn't get Nortenos. Um, if a Norteño would come into our system, they'd be segregated and put in a different area, not in the jail I was at. Mm -hmm. um, we had to because th they were like on site, Southsiders and, and the north side. Um, we had Crips from every neighborhood you could think of. I mean, 
street gangs really originated from Los Angeles with the Crips, the Bloods, and Mexican Mafia is a gigantic influence. Mexican Mafia runs our jails. Um, the numbers of Hispanic inmates far outweigh the numbers of black inmates. So we'd have to be really cognizant of the fact of the ratios in these dorms. Oftentimes it was a three to one ratio, Hispanics to black, um, because there was just more of them. They tried these feel good policies of segregating races, which that is a whole nother dynamic when you start doing stuff like that. It causes more problems because when you put all the Hispanics in one dorm and all the blacks in another dorm, well, we're doing, we're teetering on a line of, we're not supposed to be doing stuff like that. I get why they were doing it because of the violence, but what it caused was then the Hispanics had a power base, the blacks had a power base, and who becomes the enemy? We do. When they're amongst each other, they're worried about their politics, their programs, and they have to focus on each other. Yeah, we would get into incidents, but we weren't the primary focus. They were the primary focus towards each other. And when we separated them out, we made ourselves the focus. And that was a management decision that I tried fighting, that friends of mine tried fighting. And um, it's never a good thing when you start segregating by race. It just isn't. And now to today, they don't. They, they're all integrated back. And if they fight, they fight. If they, whatever happens. But typically, the shot caller for each race will coordinate in their respective dorms. And if a black guy makes a South Sider mad, Cholo, then typically the shot caller will go to the black shot caller and say, you better handle your person or we're going to kick it off. So then the blacks would beat down their own person that violated the rules because the Hispanics said to, that they don't want the riot, and then everything was good. It, so, ex explain what a shot caller is. Shot caller is the person that has been elected, I guess you want to call, by that respective race or group. Um, Southsiders, Sereños, Southern Hispanic street gang members, um, some with prison experience, typically. Um, very influential within the neighborhood, put a lot of work in, can be trusted, um, make sound decisions. Occasionally you would get one that, that didn't. Uh, they were using the product that they had, and usually if they were using meth and got spun out and made a bad call, they would not only get stepped down, but they would get handled by their people. They would get beat down or worse. Um, so they typically, they wanted to have shot callers that would manage the dorm. It's all about business in jail, just like it is in the streets. The more everything just flows, the more money that they're making, they're on their phones, they're moving dope on the streets, they're having, they're handling their business. Riots happen or something happens, the phones are shut off, the mail gets cut off, and um, coffee's caught, cut off, the TVs are off, they lose their whole program. They don't like that. So if there's something that somebody kicks off that shouldn't have been kicked off, you're going to guarantee you're going to have three or four people come up to the front of the, the dorm, beat up with all their stuff under their arms, say it, I need to get moved. And that happened quite often back then. So essentially a shot caller is the one that's making the decisions for whatever gangs in there. Yeah. And oftentimes if we knew we had issues coming, you can feel when you know what you're doing, you can feel the tension when you walk in. Mm -hmm. Now we're not in there with them. There's a security gate at East facility between us. And you can tell when you're sitting at the door or at the, uh, the desk and you're looking around the dorm you can tell how the people are looking at each other you can tell how they're interacting with each other you can tell when they all start trending to one side and they're all kind of talking and the other group starts moving you can tell it's going to kick off and the shot callers you know oftentimes if we saw something coming or we heard something was coming from an informant that was within the jails because we always had informants um, we would try to pull those shot callers out we would give them a bogus pass to the nurse or to clergy or something or a visiting pass and we would we would kidnap them down there in that area and pull them into an office and say we know what's coming you don't want this like it's going to screw everything up for it and sometimes it would work and they go back and and then you hear something later like hey deputy it's we got it handled don't worry about it we're good mm. and then you'd see it go back to normal and everybody be playing cards and dominoes and watching tv and there's nothing yeah so it did work but you had to have the the that whole experience to to dive into that world. And it is definitely a different world than what you and I or anybody that watching this would, would want to live. It's not our normal lifestyle. Yeah. Okay, so you do 19 months in the jail. Um, you get out, How? Uh, so you're about, what, 26, 27 yeah, at that point? 27. Okay. So before we start talking about you on patrol and everything else, give me an idea, Where? what areas did you work in your career? 
I worked in South Central Los Angeles. I worked in the North LA County desert area of Palm de Lancaster a lot too. Um, I worked over in the Lenox area by LAX. Um, we reopened Firestone Station for a period of time for a task force, homicide task force, uh, which is also South LA. Uh, we did functions all over the place though. Like the teams that I was on, we'd end up in Norwalk or we, we were all over the place, Altadena or um, if something happened, we would get sent to a different area. So I kind of pretty much, I had the run of the gamut in LA County through my career. Um, I testified in probably, I'd say 95% of the courts in LA County as a gang expert and narcotics expert during my career, mm -hmm. uh, testified in front of the grand jury as a gang expert, and narcotics expert. So I was all over the place. Had I just been assigned to one station area, I wouldn't have the experience I have. Yeah. yeah. So you start patrol. Obviously, how, starting off in the jail is giving you a little bit of experience, a little bit of confidence. But when you're starting to roll around, I'm assuming it's in a one-man patrol car. How do you feel at 27 years old, rolling around, patrolling some of these areas, basically by yourself? I think, I mean, I, I knew what loss felt like already with Shane getting killed. So I knew it was out there. I knew dealing with these guys, I knew it was out there. But I think I felt like most of us do. I was full of piss and vinegar. I was like a kid in a candy store having fun, tearing it up. Felt like I was Teflon, you know, yeah. um, rolling code three, hauling ass, taking chances, stupid mistakes, getting away with not getting killed and looking back later and saying, man, I was stupid. Um, and I had a, a lot, a lot of fun. Now, there was scary times. There was dangerous times probably every day, but um, it was like a kid in a candy store. Any close calls on patrol before you ended up in the specialty units? Yeah. I had a lot of, a lot of stuff happen. I got in a couple crashes, um, quite a few fights out there I've uh, been shot at. Um, there was just a lot, of, a lot of things were going on back then. Uh, you're talking late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty busy in South LA. There was a lot going on, every shift. Getting back to my initial question, are you, I mean, I guess you just feel it like you're bulletproof, so you're not really worried or concerned about what's, what's out there? We lived in suburbia where we could go to Starbucks and, you know, hang out and go to the movie theater and not have to worry about anything. And all of our friends are cops and firemen and we're all hanging out having barbecues. Mm -hmm. And then you go down to the ghetto and it's like cops and robbers and you're just adrenaline pump and, and just exciting the thrill of the chase. And, and so you don't really think about it. You know, you, you can't, from my experience, you can't really go to work and be so focused on the danger factor and the fear factor that you, you're going to actually make mistakes. You're going to get yourself hurt. You're going to get one of your partners hurt. You got to be smart. You got to stay focused. You got to stay. It's hard when you see people dead. You know, we're not built to be looking at dead people, dead. I don't care if it's a gangster or a little kid or a lady. Um, the stuff that you see, people shooting themselves and, and overdosing on drugs or hit by a train or hit by a car or, you know, pick the gamut of death. We see it all. And then when we leave, we go back to our families back in suburbia. Mm -hmm. And so if you focus on the loss that you're seeing and, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, every day, you're ineffective and you're a danger to everybody because you've got to have the edge. You've got to stay on top of your game. you got to stay focused. you got to stay trained. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of chaos. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, yeah, we're all lucky. I'm sure there's plenty of people that are out there that have all got their crazy stories and somehow we made it to the, the finish line. Um, and I'm thankful that I made it to mine because I've had multiple friends that didn't. So, how did you how did you deal with that internally? Uh, seeing dead bodies, you know, basically a lot of danger. You know, we we talked about this, right? Society doesn't really understand what law enforcement does. Okay, and so there's a lot of stuff that <clears throat> we see that people have no idea what's going on. A lot of evil, a lot of violence, a lot of, you know, just in general, bad things. How did you personally deal with that stuff? I worked out a lot. I ran a lot. And I had a lot of friends that we would hang around and tell war stories all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the problem that came with it, and the extremely negative thing that I've tried to counsel people on since then, is the drinking. Alcohol is huge uh, in law enforcement. 
you drink for every reason. You drink for a transfer party, you drink for a promotion party, you drink for an after shift party, you drink for off training party, uh, you drink for a just because party, uh, you drink in the parking lot of the station, you drink at the local watering hole, um, hit a bar on the way home. And I'm not talking by yourself, I'm talking, it was just the common, we, we had tight knit groups. Um, I see the stuff that's going on in LA right now with this gang tattoo and, and these things are talking about these different stations. Honestly, and I'll say it, it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, well, explain that. Explain these gang tattoos uh, for the people that don't know. So the definition of a criminal street gang is three or more members with a common sign or symbol engaging in a pattern of criminal activity. And what people have decided to do, because some deputies have made some poor choices at parties drunk or hazing trainees or whatever it, it is, they put a jacket on them now because they have a station tattoo that they're somehow part of a gang like they're out there killing people and murdering people would be a better term of what they're trying to insinuate um, doing all kinds of dirt and getting a tattoo because they've earned it from being corrupt and now somehow you know there's certain i'm not going to start bringing up tattoos and names but i'll tell you the certain stations you're in the biggest the, the shit of the shit in society you are taking rounds, you you know, you're having to get into shootings. And, and we don't, I don't know a single guy that I've ever worked with, including myself, who shot somebody and felt good about it. 99.99% of the time, when you have to discharge your gun in the line of duty, you feel kind of just weird afterwards. Like, that sucks, that sucked. It is what it is. It was him or me or them or I or, or was my partner or, you know. Um, and you don't feel good about it. And... When you're out there in the mix and you're putting a ton of hard work in, when you when you're out there chasing the bad guys, you're gonna get into stuff. It's not like you're you know working in a courthouse and you're turning a key every day and signing paperwork and sitting at your desk reading a book or scrolling on your cell phone. You're out in the heat of the battle. Violence is abound. There's murders, there's robberies, there's rapes, there's you name it, all day, every day in South LA. And you have hardworking guys and girls that are out there. Girls are getting the tattoos too. You have high, you know hard workers that are out there kicking ass. They're taking the bad man off the street. They're saving lives. And when they survive stuff and they've put an, a quality of work in, some of the older cops, man, this chick or this this dude's putting work. He's humble. They're they're putting all this work in. They're hooking and booking. Everybody's going to jail. And they're getting all this dope and guns off the street. We should we should ink them up and be part of our like. It's a hardworking fraternal organization is what it is. Mm -hmm. It is not a come be a gangster with us. We're corrupt. We're going to plant dope on people. We're going to kill people. We're corrupt. Yeah. So join us. Yeah. It is not that. It's it's just like the military, the Marine Corps, all these different uh, groups, even the Navy SEALs. They have nicknames for different units that they work. They have tattoos they put on them. It is a pride thing. And somehow with all the liberal BS that's gone on in our world and our society, we've allowed to be painted in this box now where if we don't conform or look exactly the way people expect us to look, we're labeled some. We're corrupt. We're always corrupt. We're always lying. We're always heavy handed racists. And so you're seeing more people wanting to be part of a fraternal group within law enforcement because they, they almost feel like we need protection. We need more, more of us to be like safe or we feel safe around each other. If you're inked, then I feel like I can trust you because you're a hard worker like I am. If you're not inked, why aren't you inked? You know, you get that stuff. And about, about seven or eight years ago, I was asked to join a think tank group with the sheriff's department. They were looking at tattoos and about exactly what we're talking about. They wanted to start looking at whether or not they could ban tattoos and all this stuff. And, and I, I laughed. I told the chief that called me, I'm like, I, I don't want to get involved in this crap, but if it'll help, I will. So I did. And I went and sat at one meeting with a bunch of chiefs commanders and captains and I heard a couple of them talking and I sat there and I didn't say a damn word. I'm a detective at the time. I'm not even a sergeant yet. I'm just a detective. But I was in so much shit out there. So afterwards it was all said and done. The undersheriff came and pulled me aside. They're like, you didn't say a word. I said, no, sir. Why not? Well, I'm looking at everybody. They're all saying it. I got nothing really to, to offer to this. I probably shouldn't even be in this group. Well, no, I want to know what you think. And I told him exactly what I think, what I just told you. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, are you tatted? I said, no. 
I said, I've been offered four tattoos. I haven't taken one. I don't believe in them for me personally. Not that it's the station tattoo or the unit tattoo. I just don't have any ink on me. I don't have my daughter's name on me or my wife's right. name on me right. or barbed wire, you know, for working out, you know, whatever, all these crazy things. I just don't, I'm not an ink guy. I don't like needles. And uh, I said, but it's not that I, I didn't get one because of anything it was other than my personal preference. You know, I've been offered them. My wife was offered a tattoo for a station. And my wife was a cop too. And we both just, we're not into tattoos. She doesn't have one. She doesn't have a tramp stamp or any of this other bullshit that goes on. We just don't like ink. So I told him what I thought of this tattoo thing. They never called me back for another meeting. I wasn't part of the group anymore. Mm. I wasn't conforming to what they were trying to direct their narrative of, of what you see in the department today. Mm. They didn't want to hear my point of view. They did until they didn't. Yeah. And as soon as they didn't, Thanks for your time. Okay. Deuces, I'm out. But so I was telling people, hey, be careful. You know, now they're to the point where they almost want to check your, when you're getting dressed in the locker room, to see if you got one on your leg. And they've got books that are flooded. They're trying to see who's part of what group and so that they can start labeling people. And I got questioned, and I used to love baiting a defense attorney when it was becoming a hot topic because I'd be involved in a murder case or a drive by or whatever. And defense attorneys were getting emboldened because of the stuff that's going on in the news. We're paying for it in court. We're paying for it across the board. All these criminals are now using these talking points as a defense for their cases. We're all corrupt. We're all lying, cheating, thieving gangsters ourselves. And so I knew it was coming, and I would bait the defense attorney in to forcing to ask certain questions along those lines so that I could fire off in front of the jury. Um, and when I got accused, oh, you're probably one of them. And when I could say, no, I'm not. I have no ink on my body. None. Zero. And it would shut them up pretty quick. And so the whole merits of this tattooed gang cop thing that you're going to see nationwide, it's been on nation, national news, the sheriff in LA County and LAPD, they're banning blue line flags now too. You can't even have a blue line flag because now that's perceived as racist. All it is, is they are destroying and dismantling law enforcement from within. They're trying to disrupt the camaraderie, not criminal behavior, not criminal activity, camaraderie. They want to divide it. They want to separate it, weaken law enforcement, and who pays? The people pay in the streets. Yeah. That's the reality of it. So no, this this I'm a gangster because I have a tattoo, cop thing. It's it's predicated on absolute bullshit. And any guy that wants to come claim to be a gang expert, I'll challenge them and sit it and debate them on it. Yeah. They're they're full of it. I want to know who's paying them, and you know I'm not getting paid to sit here with you now. I'm doing stuff up here in, in Idaho with the legislature. I'm not getting paid a penny. I'm retired. I can say what I want now. I'm not bound by policies, procedures, or anything else. I don't give a shit. Yeah. So, well, before we start moving on to what you're doing now, let's talk a little bit about what you did. What were your job functions when you started? You basically got out of the jail and started kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, started uh, following your passion, which is the gang stuff. Yeah. So, what did you do? I went to um, when I first got pulled to the gang unit. I went to Palmdale uh, gang team a gang enforcement team. So we were on the streets every shift. Uh, we were a team of six plus a sergeant. Um, the neighboring station at Lancaster had six plus a sergeant. So if we had anything big going on, there'd be 12 of us plus two sergeants. It was a pretty good team. And we got involved in all kinds of stuff. We were identifying gang members and rolling on shootings and developing informants and, and um, pretty much a first line of investigative tool for our OSS investigators, which were the actual gang detectives who got the cases that we generated or the shooting cases. We would be the intel. They would be the investigators. Um, and we helped homicide all the time because whenever there was a murder, we had the informants on the streets. I had a ton of informants. That was what I was known for. And uh, we would just greatly assist investigations beyond what we would do. And sometimes we'd, we'd stop a gangster with a gun and the gun came back used in a homicide or whatever. And now we've got a relationship because not every gangster hated us either. We had great relationships with a lot of dudes on the street, cut a lot of breaks. Um, we worked with a lot of people and we built that informant base up and it was fun. And but because of the work I was doing on that team, a uh, homicide guy called me up in 2005 and um, he had asked me if I wanted to come joined a homicide task force that were putting together on Florencia 13 and East Coast Crips that were killing each other like crazy. Mm. They wanted saturation patrol with gang units down there to find out what was going on, take everything, move to go to jail, flip informants. Um, 
So we did. In that time prior to, uh, we lost a couple friends. Um, Jake Karigian was killed about 10 days after 9-11 happened. He was ambushed at a, uh, there was a shooting that, there was a search warrant in Stevenson Ranch, California that went to shit and ATF operation, ATF asked for help. Jake rolled in, he was on a motor and the guy sighted up his motorcycle helmet hiding behind a car and shot him, killed him. He was a guy that I used to ride along with at Malibu when I was a kid. So mm -hmm. we were pretty close. I was working that morning and responded. Those happened prior to me going to this other task force. Um, in 2003, um, 2003, yeah, August 2nd, 2003, Deputy Steve Sorensen was murdered up in Lancaster, Lake LA area, um, when I was out there working. Um, Arrow ended up finding the suspect vehicle. They, the suspect, basically, Steve put out radio traffic and then no traffic. Neighbors were calling in, they heard shots fired. They couldn't get Steve on the radio. And I was getting ready to go down to Compton on an overtime shift. And I called down there and said, hey, we got a missing deputy. And I ended up rolling out to the middle of nowhere. And by the time I got out there, two deputies found uh, Steve. The suspect had tied him around the legs to a bumper of a, his own patrol car and drove him, dragged him down the road for a mile um, and then fled. And so, I was zigzagging out in the middle of nowhere. I see a hel our helicopter. They direct me in to where they think the suspect vehicle is. And I turned a corner. As soon as I, the aero unit said, hey, as soon as you stop and turn, like at that intersection, do not move. It's going to be right there. So I start to turn. I stop. And there's the suspect vehicle about 50 yards away. I confirmed it. And I'm like, oh, shit. I'm in the middle of the desert. I got no cover. I'm by myself. And I now I know Steve's dead, but they found his body. And... Guns were missing, I think. Uh, guy's name was Donald Kuek. And so it ended up being a very lengthy operation. Just another loss is my point in all this. It was mm -hmm. just another deputy loss during my short, you're talking from 97 when Shane got killed to 2001, Jake gets killed, to 2003, Sorensen gets killed. And then now I'm on the task force. And so we're tearing it up in South LA and our lieutenant pulled us off of the Florencia team at one point, brought us up to Haida, and we started working at Haida on the Florencia thing because we were up on some wires. What, they they what, were up on wires. We were more of a, of a street level helping them out to follow up. Robert, what's Haida? High intensity drug trafficking area. Okay. It's basically a federal task force, wiretaps, organized crime, organized drug trafficking organization within a DEA, FBI. I mean, I, we work with different people on those task forces, but it's primarily DEA. Um, and so with the wiretaps, we started chasing stuff that was going on down in, in South LA related to Florencia 13 and murders. Uh, we would hear them on the wire hunting black people down straight race war. Um, what, what do you mean? You'd have a gangster. We had this one target, um, who would talk to the homeboys and, and laughing on the phone. Hey, I got one. I got one that just went to the barbershop on central and 76th or I, I got two, they're sitting on the corner outside and they're talking about mayates, monkeys. And so we knew what they were referring to and we would be sending, either if we couldn't get there, we'd send other people to get to the area. Uh, and we knew who the targets were we're looking for. Uh, there was a couple murders that happened, um, but we would get later, like we're off or nobody's monitoring the wire, shut down for the night, come in the next day, you're starting doing, typing up the line, the lines on the, the calls and listening to them and it's like, ah, shit, you know. But then we knew who was involved. And unfortunately, sometimes you couldn't even share the information with homicide because they'd blow up the federal case over a murder of another homeboy in-house, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it wasn't even the Hispanic on the black. It was within their own clique or their own uh, neighborhood of Florence 13. So we were there for a while. Then we got sent down to Compton, um, Nutty Block Crip, Trag New Park Crip, War. It was another saturation operation. Just tear everything up and go after it. And while I was on that, I got offered to become a detective at Lenox Sheriff Station, which is closer to LAX, that side. And so I promoted it to detective. Well, the same week that I got that call to promote, I was at the Haida office in, in a Rampart area of LA. And I think it was on Wilshire or Six or something like that. Um, my partner and I were there and Jerry Ortiz, who was one of our gang guys down in Lakewood, 
who was also on my list to promote to detective, uh, got shot and killed. And so we rolled from Haida to Lakewood and helped out with the ensuing murder case. Um, the the Hanley detective on that was an outstanding investigator. Uh, Mark Lillianfield, he handled the Mickey Thompson murder. Mickey Thompson was a big car dude back in the, you know, let's say the 90s or early 2000s. Um, Lillianfield was the guy and he had the handle on that case. And he knew me from other murder investigations. He knew me from one of my shootings I was involved in. And he said, as soon as he saw me, he's like, dude, you're next to me. And so I started helping on the case. It was pretty hard seeing Jerry's car sitting there still in the middle of the street, car door open, driver's door open, sunglasses in the street, uh, knowing he was killed, suspects outstanding. And it was a gang murder. We know it was Hawaiian Gardens that did it. There was huge investigation, federal investigation after that. I believe Haida was involved in that, the Hawaiian Gardens Task Force. And they took down a ton of people. They made a show, uh, there's a bunch of TV shows on it. Um, took down a lot of people behind that murder. They found the shooter five doors down, hiding in a bathtub. And ironically, my team that I had worked up in Palmdale, who got deployed down to Lakewood, found that they got that apartment where the suspect was discovered. And one of my old partners found the gun stashed in a speaker box in the front room of that house. That was mm. the gun that was used to kill Jerry. Um, so here we are now, you know, I can start listing the people that I'm talking about that we lost. And now I'm promoted to detective. I went to Lennox and I was at Lennox maybe, maybe a month and a half, maybe two months. And then I got sent back up to Palmdale. Um, so I kind of got juggled around work in the county, but it gave me a tremendous amount of experience. Um, I was up in AV for Antelope Valley for a while. I ended up on another federal task force, uh, another Haida group, working in Lanka's 13, which is another gang that we had that was tied to the Mexican Mafia. And I did that for about a year until the takedown. And then I went to a workstation level detective, gang detective up there. And then a sergeant called me and asked me if I wanted to go to a Mexican Mafia related task force. So I did that. In that time frame, uh, I had written a search warrant on a Mexican Mafia shot caller. And it was my day off. I got called in. They had a low jack hit to a car that was in the backyard of a house. They tracked it there. They looked in the windows. They detained the gangster. They looked in the windows. There's ammo laying on the floor. It's his house. He's on parole. You know, we don't want to do just a parole search. We don't know what's all involved. Can you come in or, and figure it out? So I went in. I'm like, let's just write a warrant. Let's not do a parole search game. Let's write paper. So I wrote paper and um, didn't think anything of it. At the station, the deputy hits me up and says, hey, um, you need to be careful. I said, what are you talking about? He's like, homeboy said that he knows where you live on the west side of town with your wife and daughter. He's seen you at your house. And I'm like, oh, shit. So, I, and I lived on the west side of town. Um, not in Shittsville, but I lived like in the edges of the, of the valley. And so I, I reached out to one of our guys, uh, Mike Staley, outstanding. He also died, he died of cancer after retiring. But uh, reached out to him and said, hey, this is what I got. You know, can you guys look into it? He's like, yeah, you know, it's guys talk. I'm like, yeah, Mike, but I live on the west side of my wife and daughter, ex-wife. Um, <clears throat> so we go about our business. About a week later, Major Crimes calls me and says, hey, do you have somewhere you can go? And I said, why? What's up? We intercepted a kite at Men's Central Jail coming out of High Power. High Power, Module 1750 at MCJ was where we kept all the Mexican Mafia shot callers, all the Crip, Black Gorilla family shot callers, movie stars, athletes, high profile inmates. That was 1750. But a row there was typically Mafia shot callers. And they intercepted a kite coming off the road that I had a green light uh, for what I did to the dude on the street on the search warrant. And, and for the audience, what's a green light? It's a hit. Basically, they ordered a hit on me. Okay. So now with him saying what he said, and now I've got a confirmed hit, um, I had to leave town for about a week, two weeks. I don't remember now. A week or, it was a blur now to think back to a week or two. I took my motor home. I went up to Buena Vista up outside of Bakersfield, my motor home, until they called and said, hey, they were ready. And what were ready meant was that they had 24-hour protection blocked up for me. They had teams available. Um, everywhere I went, I had people following me. 
undercover cops that looked like bikers and gangsters themselves that were there to protect me. Um, my wife, my ex-wife, when she took my daughter to school, they'd follow her to the school, make sure she got to school okay. If I went to pump gas in my car, I'd have two guys that would park around me like they were pumping their gas. They were an undercover cop. I had to live like that for a month hmm. everywhere I went. And what ended up happening was the, the shot caller that I took down on that search warrant on my day off when I had nothing to do with nothing, I called in, freaking bad luck. But I knew him and he knew me because of the activity that I was involved in the street, the gang. Um, his cover story, because it turns out he owed $14,000 in dope debt to the main Mexican mafia guy. And he went into custody owing that. Mm. So he's got a bounty on his head for owing that money. His cover story was that I was corrupt and that I stole the money. In essence, I stole the money from the Mexican mafia. Right. So it was quickly our investigators, Mike Staley and Dana Duncan, those guys were absolutely phenomenal investigators. And they ended up handling it. And multiple meetings, I guess, with the mafia guy. And it was kind of quickly understood that the dude was lying. And you don't want this war. Like we don't, the thing about it, it's such a twisted world and the gang life and, the, and in a lot of these circles of organized crime, if you're, if you're doing your job and you're doing the right thing and you don't lie on them, you don't cheat on them, you don't plant dope, you don't do that stuff. Typically there is still some element of respect. If you just get caught slipping and you're not a heavy, you're not kicking their ass, you're not threatening them, you're not planting dope, you're not doing all this stuff. They're kind of, they, they chalk it up to, you got caught, dude, deal with it. But when you say something different, like you're stealing from them, that's what puts it in a different realm. So once they were able to direct the narrative that this is a bunch of BS, you know, you, this guy's trying to cover his ass. Um, the dude that put the hit squashed it. However, and the dude went to jail. He ended, We ended up ad charging him for criminal threats. He pled guilty, took like six years state prison on threatening me and my family. It didn't change where I lived. It didn't change what, you know, once the teams were off, I had to now live like that. And I ended up getting a divorce. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say too My ex-wife is still out there in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard now because even now when I'm here, and even now that I'm getting involved in stuff here with the legislature, but prior to that, I have to think like the rest of my life about that, even though it's squash. And the only thing that I, I feel better about is, and it's, it sounds kind of crazy, but so Staley called me in about 2013 or 2014 and said, Hey dude, dude's paroling out. Be aware, share the picture with whoever you see anybody that looks like him or peanut head or whatever around him. Um, make sure you're ready. And if he shows up anywhere where you are, it isn't for the right reasons. And I said, okay. So come to find out that dude's been in and out of prison several times since 2013, 2014, somewhere right in there. Um, the Mexican mafia shot caller was just murdered in one of the prisons by a fellow Mexican mafia member within the last two or three months. Mm. I still stay up on all of it because I kind of have to. And one of the other shot callers that was his right hand man, who I also was responsible for, for catching, who was wanted for a double murder. Um, and he knew me well too. And he knew that that issue existed. He was just murdered in a hit. Um, so two of the main players that were responsible for everything were just murdered within the last two, three months. Mm. So I feel a little bit, sadly, I know it sounds weird, feel a little bit better about it. Yeah. Um, but it is the chaos of the lifestyle that we, we've lived. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that, Robert. What, um, how did, how did being in law enforcement affect your family, first of all? It affected it tremendously. Um, my ex-wife was not in law enforcement. She didn't understand it, couldn't relate to me. There was a major disconnect. I felt unheard, not related to when I got involved in stuff. Um, I got hurt in the line of duty, blew my shoulder out, had to get taken to the hospital. She didn't come to the hospital. We had a great relationship. <laughs> um, I was involved in a shooting down in, in um, Compton and we killed a guy in front of his family and she didn't, it was kind of like a disconnect. And then five months later, I got into another shooting and we killed two guys. And um, again, disconnect. By that point, I was pretty much checked out anyways from her, from my relationship. What I was turning to was my friends and alcohol. We were drinking all the time. How, <clears throat> I'm curious, 
how long had you been on the job before you got married the the first time with this the ex wife you're talking about right now? Okay. So she'd been around from the big from the beginning. Yeah. She just didn't get it. No. She lived in her bubble as long as the paychecks and all that overtime was coming in and she was spending it. Hmm. I was gone all the time. Yeah. I was maxed out on overtime. I was always gone, gone, gone. Hmm. I guess she got used to living like that. I got used to living the way I did. I felt unsupported. And you know, drinking and hanging out with the boys all the time didn't help. Yeah. And that camaraderie that we talked about with tattoos and all that stuff, that camaraderie also does sometimes include alcohol. Yeah. And women and, you know, things like that. You got guys and girls dating through work. Um, so it, it just makes it easier to sabotage and just chalk it up and, and move on. And that's what I did. I ended up getting divorced. So a lot of it has to do with, yeah, I mean, just a disconnect. She didn't really understand. There was no kind of communication. Um, how about how about kids? Did it affect your kids at all? Yeah. My daughter at the time, well, when my daughter was three. Three? No, my daughter was younger than that. My daughter was a year and a half old, and I moved into the guest room of our own house. Hmm. And I lived there for five years. I didn't leave the house because of my kid. Yeah. So I knew that every week on Sunday, I would never work Sundays. And I mean, God forbid, unless there was something major that happened. Somebody right. got shot, killed, you know, that I got called in for. Right. But um, so I knew every Sunday I was home and I tried to be home like every Wednesday night. And my daughter would come into my room. It's like I'd go get her out of her crib or out of her bed when she was a little bit older, three years old, and put her in bed with me, bring the dog in my room, shut the door. And that was how I lived for almost five years. Hmm. Um, and it was because I should have looking back, I should have left. Yeah. I cost myself a lot of money in retirement <laughs> by, by staying, but I was staying because of my kid. Sure. And even though it wasn't the best, you know, now my daughter, she, you know, that's all she knew. She doesn't remember me and her mom ever being, and she's 23 now. Yeah. She does not remember us being together. She tells me all the time, like, I don't know even how you and mom were ever together. Like we're so to today we're so different does your daughter have any rig- residual negative effects or does she remember you being a law enforcement what's what's her take on it well this will be a little convoluted but so my daughter um it affected her for sure and it was a very nasty divorce um very psychotic divorce i had to get a restraining order on my ex-wife um she used to file complaints through my work all the time um she would tell my daughter horrific things all the time. She threatened to drive my daughter and her into a brick wall. Like I went through a lot of stuff for years, years of it. Mm-hmm. But as my daughter got older, um, you know, I would go to her work, her work, her school, and I would bring lunch, go get Panda, get Subway, and I go sit with her and all of her little classmates in my uniform and have lunch. All the kids knew me. All the parents and school teachers and yardy all got to know me. I did a presentation for the school. And I was there all the time yeah. because I wasn't able to see, I was working so much, but I at least would take the time to go to the school for my lunchtime. And that, so she grew up with that. And I never missed like a volleyball game or I always made sure to make that stuff. And as she got older and as I continued on um, in my latter years on the department, she come out right along with me. And I, because I was a sergeant, um, I'm not pushing a car to where I'm, having to answer your mundane domestic snows. I mean, if there's an emergency call, I got to go to it. But yeah. um, so you know, a couple of times a month, I take her out for a couple hours uh, on a ride along. And so she loved it. And she'd see me at work in that capacity. She'd see me giving people breaks and stop people that have a little bit of marijuana, maybe a suspended driver's license. And, and I'm not taking them to jail and towing their car because for whatever reason, we have discretion. The most powerful tool that law enforcement has is not our gun. It is not our our handcuffs and our pepper spray and our jujitsu, it is discretion and it is reasonableness and it is our mouth and how we talk our way into things or how we talk our way out of things by, by being respectful, respectful. Um, so I had that, she got to see that with me with work and my last shift as a cop. So we're jumping ahead just because you're asking me about my daughter. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My last shift as a cop, um, March, it was March 5th of 2020, right in the heart of when COVID kicked off. Um, Palmdale Station deputies got involved in a pursuit, two suspects. Suspects were shooting at them out both windows. Um, the car was somewhat disabled, crashed through a fence, 
uh, at an airport up in Palmdale and they came back out. So the hood was up over the windshield and they were driving, you know, dudes driving, looking out the side. Um, watch commander canceled the pursuit until the suspect started shooting at the police helicopter. And then it was all bets were off. I was down hour away, 45 minutes away in another city. And it was coming down the freeway towards us. Daughters on a ride along. And so um, I end up, they're asking for anybody with bulletproof shields. Well, as a sergeant, we carried a ballistic shield in our car. And so I acknowledged on the radio and responded code three and, and met them about halfway up the 14 freeway as they were coming down at Agua Dulce Canyon. And I pulled over to the side of the, the freeway on my side, but down just beyond the, the rise of the freeway. So that I didn't want them passing and dumping rounds on me because they were already shooting everybody else. And I ran to the back seat and I had all my equipment. I'm like throwing it and I popped my back and I'm like yanking the shield out, throwing it on the front seat on my daughter. And <clears throat> uh, they pass by. I get back on and now I'm in the, the conga line and they're shooting, you know, and we're going down the 14 freeway at 80 or whatever it was. And news helicopters overhead, they're carrying it live. And we get on the southbound five freeway. And then as they get onto the, go to the um, eastbound 210 freeway from the southbound five. Cars disabled, throwing sparks everywhere. Again, news is all over it, five helicopters, whatever. And they end up having to stop. Driver gets out, fires off one more round, and the front patrol cars, gang unit guys from AV, Antelope Valley, start putting rounds, AR-15s and stuff, to like 40 rounds were fired. I didn't hear a single round, not one. Um, but that guy, the shooter, dropped the pistol, ran down the side of the freeway, and is now running across the freeway as I'm pulling up. And so I stop in the center divider. He's ran through. We got pretty much south, uh, southbound five freeway traffic is stopped because of the pursuit and everything that was going on. There's so many units there, uh, but the northbound traffic is still coming. And the guy goes over the center divider. We all go over the center divider after him. And a physical altercation occurs in the middle of the freeway. Cars are whipping around. One deputy got hit by a car. Hmm. Um, he was trying to carjack people going northbound because traffic's starting to slow. Everybody's looky loo, and he thinks he's going to jump in a hoop and, and take off. Turns out he's got two bullet wounds from ARs in his legs, um, pocket full of dope, meth, a um, bunch of dope in the car, more guns in the car, more dope in the. I mean, it just, it was, they were all from Northern California, the two of them. And <clears throat> I tweaked my back that night pretty good, my neck. And I, I called my wife. I'm like, hey, uh, she goes, what are you doing down at the 5210? And I'm like, oh, well, we kind of got in an incident. And then she saw the breaking news and she got pissed. My current wife, like she's a cop. We, we have an outstanding relationship. She's my best friend. And um, she's like, what the hell? You got Megan? I go, yeah, I know. And so I'm like, I, I think we're done. And we had already bought our house up here and I was going to go back and forth and commute. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, I'm good. I, I've been, one of my buddies who got killed, he was already geared up to buy a place up here. Him and his wife had come up here a few times. They were going to retire to Idaho. And he was like me. And we got into all kinds of shit together. And uh, he was within a year of being retired. And he got smoked on a call, a burglary call. And so I was like, you know what? I'm playing with fire. I'm at the end of my rope, end of my career. I could put five more years on, but I'm hurt. And, you know, what's the best case scenario? If I tweak my back and my neck, and I know it's tweaked, Maybe I just pull my ticket and I'm done, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I went to the doctor and I got a jacked up discs in my low back, jacked up discs in my neck with a bone spur and stuff. And I said that I'm, I'm done. So I didn't go back. That was my last shift. So it was with my daughter. So they asked you about my daughter, my kids. That's with my daughter. So <clears throat> does your daughter have any desire to, I mean, I don't know what she does. Did she, did she any desire following that to go into law enforcement or anything like that? She joked about it, but no. Okay. No. Okay. But she hundred percent support. Like she loves yeah. cops. Like they, yeah. she works at a coffee place and uh, you know, they come in and, and she cuts some free coffee and stuff. Like she's just, she totally supports our cops here even. Yeah. All right. I'll have to figure out what coffee shop that is. <laughs> um, okay. So let's, let's talk about what you're doing now. Obviously, you can't sit still. You got to be busy. So, so what are you doing? Came here uh, after that incident with the intention of laying low, enjoying retirement, dealing with the doctors that I'm going to have to deal with, 
uh, getting physical therapy and <clears throat> sitting there and a lot of my friends transferred up here, a lot of them. And so I got friends at Ada County Sheriff's. I got a couple at Boise PD and at Caldwell PD. And hearing the stories, hearing stuff that's going on, I'm kind of like getting that uh-oh feeling like you keep hearing all the people that are pissed that Californians are coming here. And I see the Californians that I know that are coming here are all people like us that are all conservative. We all want to escape the chaos and nonsense of Prop 47 and 57 and all this crap going on and that have destroyed California, the homeless crisis, the drugs, the no, nobody's held accountable for anything. So I came here with the intention of chilling and just enjoying retirement, getting the help I need for my stuff. That's why you see me shuffling in the chair a lot. I keep my back sitting for a long time sucks. So I, I come here fishing in the backyard. We bought a house on a little pond, lake, whatever you want to call it. And my kids playing football at high school. And a week after we moved here, it came down with type one diabetes. So that was a shock to us. It changed our whole life. And so I made sure that I was at every football practice. Uh, I didn't miss anything for him at school because it's a very intricate dynamic, especially being newly diagnosed to manage blood sugar. And he's on shots for all the meals and he didn't have a pump yet. There was just all these different things that went on. So it was good that I was done because I could be there for him. And it's a, for me, it was medical necessity. You want to play football, I'm going to have to be there. Yeah. Um, so I did that. <clears throat> Still talking to my friends that are up here working, hearing the crime things that are going on. One of my buddies got in a pursuit and a guy shot at him over by the airport. And he didn't get hit and he didn't return fire. They ended up getting the guy barricaded and stuff. But I hear that. And <clears throat> in uh, April of last year, one of my good friends got shot and stabbed on the I-84 out past the airport on a call. Um, he was in critical condition. He just had a surgery this last week, another one, Ada County deputy. And so I see these things going on. I'm like, I, I, I feel like I got to get involved. I got to do something. I'm not getting paid. Can't be a cop anymore. Uh, but what can I do? And so I got kind of hooked in with some legislators and started looking at, well, what are the weaknesses here that we can try to help law enforcement? There's weaknesses with fentanyl enforcement, trafficking. I wrote a bill, tried to do something last year, uh, a lot of politics involved, and it got killed before it ever had a chance to get off the ground. Tried helping out, but there's a lot of pushback with local law enforcement. They see Cali cops come up here. They don't really want us to get involved in their stuff. I get it. If they were to come down to California and try to tell us what to do, we'd be like, who the hell is this dude from Idaho coming down here? I get it on the reverse. I, 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 I get it, but I also, I also would look at it from the standpoint that you moved up to Idaho and there was a reason you moved up to Idaho. And the reason is things got so jacked up down there. That's why you're here. Yeah. So I, I understand it, but Hey, listen to me a little bit because I'm, I'm talking from a, you know, place of experience. So I, I, I get it, but like you and I talk, I, I always find it frustrating that you were on the same team. hundred percent. This isn't a California, Idaho, whatever else we're on the same team. So Let's make the community that we live in the best place we possibly can. And I, I don't come here and say, oh, I'm the shit. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you what to do, how to do it, what you're doing wrong. That's not me. Yeah. I'm coming here saying, hey, like I have a unique set of skills. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I sound like one of those movies. I got a unique set of skills. But I mean, I do. I have a unique set of skills. Mm -hmm. I could testify in my sleep to these issues. Mm -hmm. Um I have a knack with dealing with really, really, really bad people. I mean, I was doing that Mexican mafia stuff for a long time and, and it is a different dynamic and all these things are coming here. They're here already. Um, and sometimes it takes an outside set of eyes to see some of the stuff that's going on because when you're so entrenched in it, you're living it every day, you don't necessarily see it all. And I saw that a lot at work where we get sent to different patrol areas for problems. We had a deputy that was killed, Dave March, um, out in, out of Temple City Station area uh, off the 210 freeway. Um, his his wife, when he died, and his sister live here and also in the, our area. Um, but we got sent to that area after he got killed. It was to saturate, to, to put cases on people and to find somebody wanted to roll that maybe would tell us who killed him because the guy was outstanding. And we were hooking drugs and guns and stuff like nonstop and people were like, where are you guys finding this shit? Well, we're finding it because we're just outside coming in we're not in the rat race of the daily life. 
we see it all differently. It's the same thing here. I'm not trying to tell people how to do it, but we come here and it's like, wow, I said, whoa, damn, oh shit. I saw, you know, I start seeing all this stuff and the fentanyl, um, I did, we didn't even talk about the school shooting. I was, I was involved in two of them, but one was really bad, Saugus High School. Um, and I was one of the first personnel running into the school and well, why don't you talk about that a, a little bit? And that's going to kind of lead into what I'm going to ask you about, you know, the, the, the school, the school thing you're trying to pass up here with the legislature. It just, I'm trying to give a perspective of why it is that yeah. I'm the way that I yeah. am. So on November 20 or November 14th of 2019, so a short four years and change ago, four years and two months, um, I was working a uh, day shift about 7.30, 7.45, somewhere in there in the morning. Call came in for shots fired at Saugus High School in Southern California. And I was a field sergeant out there that day. Santa Cruz was the patrol station. I was working at a Parks Bureau on the, um, just north of them. And oftentimes, because I was in their area so much, they looked at me like their field sergeant. I was always rolling on their stuff and helping them out. And so I was responding and there was there were updates, shots fired, um, multiple informants, that type of stuff. That's when you know it's legit. We start getting multiple informants, it's good to go. And we had trained so much on active shooter stuff. We got so tired. I was just always active shooter training. And here I was rolling to one. And when I turned on the street, when I finally got there, uh, about 10, 12 minutes, I don't know, somewhere in there. I didn't ever look at my response time. I don't know. It could have been eight minutes, but it, it just felt like an eternity. It's like when something bad happens and you call 911 and say it took 20 minutes to show up, and you're like, oh, it only took three. It just seems like an eternity. And I was hauling ass, driving on the wrong side of the road, running red lights, you know, going over the center dividers in the Ta Sheriff's Tahoe. And I turn on the street where the school is, and there's a sea of kids running past me, uh, running. And I pull into the parking lot. I'm like the, I want to say maybe the fourth, fifth unit there. And <clears throat> I didn't grab any equipment. I didn't put a helmet on or a tack vest on or grab my AR or anything. I just went. And when I ran into the school, I rounded the corner into the quad. And I see uh, my buddy who my wife refers to as her uncle Danny, Danny Finn, who's a freaking hero. Um, I ran in the corner and he's on the ground doing CPR on a boy. And there's another boy laying next to him and then there's a girl and they're all, all three of them are out, full arrest. And <clears throat> he sees me and I see him and I'm like, Danny, where's the shooter? Where's the shooter? And he's like, I don't know. He ran northbound. And I, I jumped, it was like a quad area, but there was a step up and they were all there. So I go up on that upper step and I'm looking down at, at Gracie. Her name was Gracie Muehlberger. And, um, She's laying on her back and she's staring at me, but she's staring at me with that death stare that I'd seen so many times before and all these other things that I worked. Her eyes were half masked, she wasn't breathing. And uh, she's like, we, you need to help me, we gotta do CPR. I said, I can't. He's sitting there pumping on Dominic while he's yelling at me to help him. He said, I can't stop. And I had to press on. And while I'm pressing on, they're updating. There's another gunshot victim down in the classroom on the north side of the school. I end up linking up with a couple deputies. We start clearing classrooms to get to that class and get fire in there, and, and they start treating her. And then there's another gunshot victim got it into the administrative office. Other deputies got to, to them with fire. And then they said there's another gunshot victim in the choir room. We didn't know where the choir room was, so it was like a little chaotic trying to figure out how the hell do we get to the choir room. We took a team, and we started clearing, to finding kids in, hiding in closets and all kinds of stuff, trying to get to that kid. She served, That girl survived. She got shot in the stomach, too. Um, the thing about active shooter training, and most people that have watched this that have ever been through it, you're no good to anybody if you get emotionally involved and stop at a victim. I don't care what the victim looks like. If, if there's an active shooter and they're still putting victims down, it does you no good to stop and help. As sad as that is to sound, that it does sound, we have to bypass victims to get to the shooter to put them down. We have to stop them from creating more victims. We have to. And that's what I had to do that morning. And it, I'll forever remember that morning. I'll forever remember Gracie's face. I'll forever wonder. Um, but we didn't know the suspect had killed himself. The problem with these shootings, whether it's in a, a Walmart, in a pool hall, in a grocery store, in a parking lot, in a concert, Route 91 is an example. They thought there was multiple shooters. Maybe there were, I don't know. But you get people that call in 
the Boise Town Square Mall, perfect example. There was a shooting there a few years ago. Um, law enforcement got reports of multiple shooters. They knew they had multiple gunshot victims down, so it made sense. All right, there's probably multiple shooters. People are calling in saying there's multiple shooters. You had a shooter that engages Boise PD outside Macy's over there by where the Dave and Buster's or whatever was. Um, so everybody rolled to it. Well, there was only one shooter. The problem is when shots are being fired, and this is what happened to us at Saugus High School, shots are being fired, people start running. You see people running, you see people running, and they've got one of these in their hands as they're running, and their shots fired. This becomes a gun, because that's what people see, and you become described as the shooter. And that morning at Saugus, we didn't know the shooter already off himself. There were so many reports that he was running. We pinged his phone. It went to his house up at the top of the hill. We had to go lock down his house. It was next to a elementary school. So now we're locking down elementary school. We have personnel in there with teams. And it was a cluster. Cluster fuck is what we would call it. And I'll never know if we could have made a difference with a couple of these people because we wasted so much time looking for the shooter who was already dead. He killed himself before anybody got there. There was no school resource officer there when it happened. Um, and I had gone to one other shooting, and um, it was at Palmdale, in, at Highland High School in Palmdale. It was an active shooter, shots fired. It was legit. Kid brought a collapsible AK-47 SKS-type rifle to school in a duffel bag, took it into a bathroom. Beginning of the day, 7.30, 7.45 in the morning, same scenario. Uh, pulls it out inside this bathroom by the quad. There's other kids in the bathroom. He fires off some rounds into the ceiling and tells them, I'll get out of the bathroom. So you start, oh, how committed is this guy? Because typically shooters don't do that. They just start executing. Victim count is the number one. And so he ends up going out the quad. He fires around. It skip traces whatever fragment, hits a kid, puts him down, gets him in the leg. I think the kid got scared that he actually did it. He ran, dumped the rifle, jumped the fence, and left the school. Nobody else was hurt. We still had to treat it. We had to tick forever to mm -hmm. clear that school. Um, and while that was happening, somebody stiffed in a call to an elementary school across the opposite side of town. My team got sent to that active shooter shots fired, uh, no updates. So I'm like, all right, it's probably BS, but we still got to do what we got to do. So we got there and we found little kids hiding under desks and closets. And I'm talking little kids, like five-year-olds. Um, so with those experiences back to now, we see all these shootings going on across the country. Columbine happened in 99. You got a Sandy Hook in Newtown, Connecticut. You got Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, Parkland. You got Uvalde and Robb Elementary School. You got Saugus. Now you got Perry High School in, in Iowa. You got Oxford School, I think it was Michigan. Um, these school shootings have not stopped. And every year it almost seems like we have another one. Uh, Rigby had one in 2021, 12-year-old girl brought a gun to school. She shot two students and the custodian before they tackled her down and disarmed her. Nobody died. That is Idaho's school shooting. There's another incident at Pocatello, one in Notice. Kid fired off a couple rounds with a shotgun. Nobody got hit. It ended before it got started. So we really haven't had a Saga shooting or a Parkland shooting or a you know Uvalde. Thank God, but we're on borrowed time. And I still have kids in school. My youngest is now 13. She's in middle school, um, and it scares the shit out of me, quite frankly. And you can't live in fear, but every time one of these things happen, it brings it home, and I remember what we went through. And I see the same common phrase, and I testified to this yesterday at the Legislative Committee on State Affairs. Every time a shooting happens, politicians get up, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Barack Obama, whether it's George Bush, pick them. We need universal background checks. We need to close the gun show loophole. We need to ban high capacity magazines. We need to ban assault rifles. We need red flag laws. Those talking points have been said for years. After Uvalde happened at Robb Elementary, Matthew McConaughey, the actor, got on and cried at the White House and said, we've got to do better, people. What have we done since then? Nothing. None of these things matter. We're not taking people's guns away. We don't want big government telling us what to do. So I, I wrote a bill. And I talked to a couple of legislators. There was a bill they tried a few years ago, got killed right away. And basically to try to tap into resources in our school systems in Idaho, there's a couple outliers that are already doing it um, because the law in Idaho says you can have a gun on campus and faculty can carry. However, there's a provision in there that the school boards and the districts can deny. 
And so when you have areas like Boise, West Ada, and some of these other areas, they're never going to authorize a teacher in a school with a gun, ever. And you're picking an area where there's a town of 1,000 people or 500 people, those, okay, that school's probably going to have armed personnel. So the, the goal behind the bill was to take that provision away from the district to be able to say, no, you're not carrying a gun in the school because you're basically creating a sheep's pen. Why is it that a school right over here can carry it and have somebody extra in there, but this school can't? And from what I saw personally, what I've seen across the country, um, Covenant School in Nashville last year, they had an active shooter. It took them about eight minutes to get to the, the school. There was no SRO. Cops did an absolutely outstanding, phenomenal job. There's video out. You can watch it. There's body cam. They got there. They didn't hesitate. They grabbed rifles. They went in, and they put her down, the shooter. And she, but she'd already killed kids and faculty. Eight minutes is a long time. These things end in the first couple minutes. And 95% of these guys and girls that go into these schools to do these mass shootings, that go into these stores and these malls and these churches and stuff, um, they've already made their mind up. They're on a suicide mission. They're either going to kill themselves or they're going to get killed by a cop. And they know that. Very rarely, you will see it. The Oxford shooters in custody just pled, took life. The Parkland shooter, he fled with kids. He mixed into the crowd and fled. But if you start looking at the rest of them, they're all dead. All of them. We've got to do something different. Because if there's no cop at a school, if we don't have an SRO, and cops are two, three, five, ten minutes away, Who's protecting that school? Who? We could put a metal detector at the front door. Say we do. It's great. It's a step. We don't want to turn our schools into prisons either. We don't want guard towers and razor fences. This is Idaho. What do we do different? Metal detector. Active shooter, mentality, killer, murderer, animal comes to that metal detector and it goes off and they've got a gun. Who's addressing it? There's no cop. What are they going to do? So if we have, and I know we do, Retired law enforcement, retired military. We have people that hunt, that have hunted their whole lives, proficient with firearms. Why can we not approach that issue with tangible, something different besides universal background checks and banning guns that mean nothing and find one or two faculty members, whether they're a football coach, a math teacher, the custodian who did three tours in Iraq. Why can't we find a few people to, I don't, one, one's better than none that are armed and I hear all the pushback. I get it. They're there to teach. They're not there to be cops. I understand all that, but history is telling us that that doesn't matter. You can hide behind a desk. You can hide in a closet. You can plead for your life. The Ox or the uh, Perry high school principal tried talking that shooter down three weeks ago. The guy put three rounds into him. He lived for a week or whatever in the hospital. He died in the hospital. The principal did. He tried talking the shooter down. You can't talk a mass murderer down. It is not like trying to talk to somebody who, you know, beat their wife and now they're apologetic and the alcohol is wearing off and they understand what these are psychopathic murderers that you're dealing with. They will kill. I don't care if it's a three-year-old, five-year-old, 10-year-old kid. Please don't. They're going to put rounds into them. It's for the shock value. And with the border wide open, that's a whole nother animal. We don't even know who's in our country. Schools are soft targets. Churches are soft targets. But what you're seeing Churches are arming up. Church, a lot of churches now have armed people in the congregation every single worship day. And we say that our teachers are important. We say we support them. A lot of people even bang the drum. They need to get paid more. They don't get paid enough. All these other things that we hear. And as we're talking right now, I don't know if you got kids in school. I do. Um, and what I told the committee yesterday, everybody's got kids and grandkids somewhere. And they're in those schools. And we are trusting those teachers as we sit to be in custody of our kids, teaching them. They're in their classrooms. They have their classroom rules. They tell them what to do. They grade them. They counsel them. They, they're role models for them, oftentimes. And now we're saying if Mr. Smith, the math teacher who's done time in Iraq, or he's an ex-cop, or he's a hunter, or whatever, we hand him, Here, here's your, what's your favorite guy? Okay, I want to carry a 38. Okay, well, then carry a 38. It's something. Now we can't trust Mr. Smith anymore. Now he's out of control. He's, he's a danger. He's scary. He's mean. He's, he's a potential killer. He's going to drop the gun. He's going to shoot people. He... But five minutes ago, when we paint Mr. Smith as our teacher who currently has our kids and he's teaching them math and he's teaching them and he's a role model, now we enter the gun and he's, he's a dirtbag. Can't touch him. It doesn't make any sense. So 
I get that it's controversial. I get that it's outside the box. I get it. I get that it's pushing the envelope, but I would much rather push the envelope and give these kids a fighting chance. When Mor Eva Morales was the teacher in one of them in Evaldi at Robb Elementary, her husband was a cop outside. He was one of the ones, he was the one that was on the cell phone that they put all over the news trying to paint him like he was a idiot and he's sitting there worrying about texting. That was his wife and him. She was in the classroom. He wanted to go in. They had to restrain him and get him out of the scenario because of the coward that was running that operation that would not let the officers go in. I know what I would have done. Can never second guess it now. What I do second guess is she's a cop's wife. She's probably grown up around guns with him however long that they were married. We all shoot with our wives. It's a, it's a fun thing families do together. Um, what if she had a gun that day? She was in there texting him. She was shot already. She was giving him a play-by-play. -play. She was asking him for help. Why aren't you guys coming in? Why aren't you guys coming in? She had that gun. We'll never know. But my whole point of this bill and why I was so passionate about it, looking at Eva Morales, is her personally, is why not not have her death be in vain? Why not make a bold choice to make a change in how we operate? The guns aren't going away. The psychopaths aren't going away. Kids are always going to be bullied and loners and ostracized and have their reasons, video game influence. They're all going to have these psychological, societal reasons for doing the crazy shit that they do. So that's not going away. Empty words aren't going to do anything about it. And if we can do something that the, the school shooting hasn't happened yet, we know there's going to be more shootings. We can guarantee it. It's disgusting and it's sad, but we know it's going to happen. And even Morella, she didn't have a gun that day. She was a cop's wife. She could have made a difference. I'll always think that. Um, but if her death's not in vain, then what if we save the next teacher that's in a classroom in a school somewhere across the, the state, really the country, I wish the whole country would do it, but the state, there's like seven country, or seven states in the country, I think, that are trying to do or have some form of what we got going on, but they have the restrictions that we're trying to do away with here. Um, so if you got a teacher in Rigby or in, in Coeur d'Alene or in Middleton or Lewiston or Twin Falls or Pocatello, and they're in their classroom right now, and God forbid one of these things happen, and that teacher now has a capability and puts a shooter down and saves her kids and herself or himself, it will have learned something. Right now, as we go every day, we haven't learned anything. We are all just sitting around waiting for the next hammer to drop. And then what? We're all going to say the same thing again? So, Robert, we, we talked about this briefly, and I just want to talk about Idaho because we're here, right? It's a unique state in respect that you kind of just want to be left alone. Yep. Right. Yep. But explain who gives who's giving the pushback to you on a bill like this, because it's, it's coming from multiple fronts based on on what you and I had talked about previously. And it's not necessarily all liberal Democrats. It's coming from different factions here in Idaho. Can you explain that a little bit? From what I saw, I mean, the liberal Democrats are pushing back. They're anti-gun, period. They want to take all the guns out. You know, putting a gun in a school is just contrary to anything that they stand for. Um, the libertarian uh, faction of the Republican Party, 110% behind it. It's strong on the Second Amendment. They already believe that we should be protecting our schools. They believe we should be doing something. The middle of the road Republicans, most of them are also supporting it. You have these groups on the outside uh, it was interesting hearing some of the testimony yesterday, uh, this mom, excuse me, a mom's group. And, you know, they, they, one of them testified that she was ashamed to be an American. I'm sitting there going, we're trying to protect the kids. And you are now trying to paint the teachers, the people in the schools that are working in our schools that have our kids as dangerous. And now you're ashamed to be an American because we want to do something to protect our kids. Like I, I don't get the mentality, but there's, there's ulterior motives. There's people that you're never going to be able to convince otherwise. And the interesting thing that did happen yesterday, the pushback on the bill, really, I didn't have a lot of pushback on this, this go around at all. Democrats, yes. Um, one of the Democrats yesterday appeared to be trying to kill the hearing. He was talking as slow as he possibly could, asking as many questions as he, as he could from witnesses that really had nothing to offer. 
but he knew we were on a time crunch. So he was trying to suck up as much time so that there wasn't a lot of pro testimony. It was all anti testimony. It was all mostly from that group. Um, what was interesting about that testimony yesterday is that when it was over, one of the ladies in that group came up to me and she was teary eyed. And I had spoke about the saga shooting and my experience there. And she's teary eyed. She goes, I just want to come tell you, you know, you, you really you shocked me. And I said, why? And she goes, I graduated from Saugus High School. She goes, as soon as I saw it, what you were talking about, I saw the picture and you mentioned it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like That's my alma mater. And so we ended up talking for like 45 minutes. Great conversation. Very nice lady. Um, no adversary type. I'm not that way anyway. Um, people are allowed to have their opinions. I mean, we are. It's America. But... On this issue, I'm not going to budge. We got to do something. And I pretty much told her the same thing. And during that hearing at the very end, Representative Young, she represents, I think, Blackfoot and other area out there. She updated twice during the hearing the amount of emails that were going into her legislative email address of people supporting what they were seeing in the, in the hearing, like supportive of the bill. We got to do something. And one of the other representatives did the same thing. It's like, you know, I got to tell you, I just looked through as we're sitting in this hearing, I'm counting them. I've got 200 or 250 emails in support of. And so it was giving us, we had a, the problem with the bills that are presented at the state capitol is it's surrounded by Boise. Boise is inherently liberal. We've got a liberal governor, or liberal mayor and city council and the decisions that are made around Boise typically are more liberal. The university's there, draws liberal clientele, even though my kids go there. Uh, kids are tied into Turning Point USA though, so they they still are conservative. But uh, you know, you see this stuff, and when these bills go, the amount of people that you have come in are going to be naysayers. They're going to be more trending to the liberal side because that's the geographics or demographics of what we got going on here. You're not getting the people traveling down in bad weather from Lewiston and Coeur d'Alene and from the east side of Idaho. Uh, it's just not. They can't do it. They got work, they got school, they got kids, they got whatever. They can't do it. So the voice is the liberal voice here. And they go to the Capitol and they spew a bunch of stuff. And unless you can get people to, to contradict them, that's the narrative that sets. And yesterday, it was one person after another that got up there fighting against this bill. And, and then I went up and the bill passed 11 to 2. 11 for, two against. The two against dissenters were Democrats. The other 11 on the board, on the committee, passed it to the floor with a due pass recommendation for the full House vote. Yeah. Um, people understand our kids are in danger. Unless you're homeschooling, and even in your homeschooling, what, how do you feel about going to church and somebody at church being armed? Do you feel safer or do you feel like you're now in danger because somebody's armed? I think people are seeing that our society is eroding before our eyes. Idaho is not immune. It's here. It's coming here. There was an officer involved shooting yesterday morning over off of Cole and Amity. Five officers fired their weapons at this guy. He stabbed two canine unit police dogs. Um, there was like 13 shootings across this valley last year. A Nyssa cop was killed right by the border right here. He was executed on a traffic stop. Um, my buddy was shot and stabbed over here on the I-84. Twin, Twin Falls got in a shooting last week. Things are happening in Idaho. People have got to change their mentality. They've got to realize that people like me are not a threat to them. We are a wealth of knowledge. They could tap in it, use and abuse me. I'm not making a penny. That's the interesting thing. You see all these people that naysay and they fight things, they fight bills, they fight agendas and all this stuff. They're all paid. Paid lobbyists, paid politicians, paid whatever. You have people like me that are coming in. I'm retired. I don't have to do shit. I could enjoy my retirement. I could be watching Fox News or Newsmax or... or the sporting event that's on to that day, fishing in my backyard. I got a game room. I, I mean, I, I kids, I could be doing stuff and I still do all that, but I'm also trying to take the time to protect this place. Where do we flee to from here? We're in Idaho. Where do you go from here? Wyoming. The weather sucks in Wyoming. So, I mean, I don't want to live. I got a buddy who lives in Cody and they were minus 45 or something a couple weeks ago. I'm like, oh, hell no. And there's tornadoes on the east side of Wyoming. Montana's already flipping pretty blue. All the big cities are blue. Um, Oregon, Washington, California, done. Nevada, hell no. Colorado's flipped. Where do you go? Texas is flipping. Texas has an open border with an invasion going on right now and a whole different mess. Nashville, I don't like tornadoes and bugs, you know, so no, I ain't going to Nashville. Florida sucks. Got hurricanes and, and high crime in Miami and all these other. Where do you go from Idaho? 
if you were to look at a map of the United States and include Hawaii and Alaska in it, entire country, find me the large cities that look anything like Boise, Idaho. Look at all of the large cities and, every, and even in conservative states. High crime, homeless population, drug through the roof, drugs, fentanyl is taken. We had a huge fentanyl problem here, huge. Um, but if you look on a map, you can go to downtown Boise, park your car, walk around, go to the restaurants, the bars, the Egyptian theater, go to the Capitol, walk in the Capitol. There's no metal detectors. Doesn't smell like piss all over the city. There's not trash everywhere. You'll see a couple bums that are starting to come in, which is what we need to worry about. Do we enable them or do we hold them accountable? They're found in possession of drugs or whatever. Um, but our city, if you, if you look at the map, Boise's outstanding. So is it worth fighting for? Or do we let it get to what these other big cities are, are doing and then say, all right, well, now we got to do something. And then now you're trying to play catch up and you already lost your city. And you got to take the bold stand now before it, it takes over and it takes a hold and it's already trying to start here. Um, so it's, it's fight or it's sit back, shut your mouth and don't say a word, bitch, if you're not willing to put the work in. That's kind of my mentality. I'm going to put the work in. I've been at the Capitol every day. I'm going to the Capitol when I leave here right now. Um, I want to go talk to some ISP, uh, Idaho State Patrol officers, because I keep getting word that they're getting paid shit and that they're low staffed and that there's officer safety issues because of their staffing levels. Uh, there's pushback on funding them anymore, giving them raises. I, to me, it's a pathetic joke. We got guys that, and girls that are out there. You know, I don't want to get a ticket. I hate when I get a trooper behind me on the freeway. But I also know that they're there to protect us. And God forbid your wife, my wife, our kids go off the road. Do we want to wait two, three hours to get somebody there to because they're short staffed and they're not getting paid shit and they're all leaving a lateral into other agencies or quitting law enforcement completely to go to work for a plant because it pays more money? They get more respect from a you know a metal plant or a you know some kind of other avenue and some other profession than they do being a cop. Why not leave it? Um, so I, I've been hearing a lot of stuff about ISP and, and some shenanigans going on there. So I, I wanted to go talk to a couple of those guys today and see what's up. So I, I don't have to do that shit. But again, nobody can tell me what to do. I don't work for anybody. I got no policies, no procedures. Um, I'm the president of the organization that we started, Idaho Tough on Crime. So you, you can give me hate mail. I don't care. You know, so uh, I'm doing it for the right reasons, for the people, the people of Idaho, not myself. And I get nothing to gain from it except for I'm willing to fight. And... That has been my whole career. Being a shit magnet at work, I'm a shit magnet after work. And I'm going to continue to be a shit magnet until i like six feet under, I guess. I don't know. So. Thank you very and, much. And I don't drink anymore. So it's <laughs> even worse for them because now I'm freaking sober. So. Robert, thank you very much for the interview. It's really great. Thanks for taking the time to do it. I appreciate, appreciate it. it.